Perhaps strangely, I choose to begin with the beginning of Hamlet, when the sentinels on the castle platform at Elsinore are uneasily asking each other to identify themselves. Who's there, asks Bernardo. Nay, answer me, says Francisco. Stand and unfold yourself. Long live the king, says Bernardo. Francisco, still uncertain, says Bernardo. And in some relief, Bernardo answers, he. There is something about that exchange that makes me think of the beginning of an encounter with a work of art. True West, a British painting, a Palabolus dance, Samuel Barber's summer music, the wind quintet. We can't know. We can't even know ourselves or what we will feel and discover when the lights go on and the action starts and we make out the road moving behind the trees. A space, a kind of empty imaginative space opens before us in our experience. Things are initially vague, as hard to decipher perhaps as the faces in the murky night at Elsinore. It is only when we begin attending, single out the details, the particulars, that the space begins to fill <clears throat> and we begin charting our way somehow reading what we are watching or listening to, grasping it and making it ours. There are other examples of what I have in mind. One from a novel we're reading in our workshop called The English Patient, in part about a mysterious pilot who fell from the sky with his helmet on fire over the African desert in the Second World War. He's picked up by nomads or Bedouins and carried through the sand. And at length, he is brought to a hospital in Pisa and at last to an abandoned hospital in a villa near Florence, where he's taken care of by one young nurse when the hospital staff evacuates the ruin at the end of the war. I find things in that novel that truly give rise to events in my consciousness that change me as potent metaphors will. The pilot in his childhood says he inhabited a landscape of trout streams and bird calls, which he recalls as a fully named world. Carried through the desert, his eyes are covered. He cannot recognize the signs, but there is more. Deserts for me, and probably for many of you, especially African deserts, are empty spaces of whiteness, totally unnamed. In this book, the desert is gradually named. It becomes the fertile lands of Cyrenaica, the salt marshes of El Algila. There are hidden towns and the sounds of musical instruments. There are winds with names, a town called El Taj. There are Goron tribes who crush a food made out of colocynth. There are oases, names for a long, unnameable world. I said that I find in that a metaphor comparing what are on the face dissimilar. The desert becoming filled up with settlements and colors and moving nomads and dancing boys and figures in burnooses and the experience of those of us who find our lives being changed by active encounters with the arts. True West for me is another example of what can happen when a play becomes the object of a reflective consciousness, when it is rendered meaningful by an active noticing and offering of attention. Like the rest of you, I'm sure, I was brought up with movies about cowboys and Indians called Westerns. My present experience is replete with images emerging from California of earthquakes and riots and O.J. Simpson and Sunset Boulevards, the current West, pre presented as the true West to many of us these days. There is something like a desert in that array of images and what Lee in the play so haltingly calls cliché. A fictitiousness took it over long ago. And I reach back into the history I recall, trying to recapture what? The real West of the settlements and the terrible journeys 
and the escapes from the Dust Bowl and the Golden Gate or the Golden Mountain made of artifices and too often false dreams. And then like the rest of you, I engage with this play, I must say not for the first time, and I play the experience of seeing the stage world against the experience of the textual world I find in the printed book, which I suppose I read in part as a work of literature. Maybe for that reason, the connections I make as my imagination went to work weaving designs, making connections, creating new patterns were with the great Gatsby and the search for the green light, the quest corrupted by the foul dust of the eastern air. And then I thought of Langston Hughes and the dream dying like a raisin in the sun. And then I remembered, partly because I teach these things, the presence of the wilderness in the American mind, the wild places, the places that had to be defended against by the building of a stockade, or the building of a school, or the building of small windowless log cabins where people could huddle in fear of windblown space and buffaloes and strangers rushing by on horses trying to reclaim the land. And out of all this and other memories and other associations, I became in some way participant in the action of True West with that desert, be it called Dakota or the Mojave or Tornado or even Alaska, out there beyond the elevators, Austin is charged with riding and the computer and the toasters and the six packs and the plants that die in their particular foul dust if someone doesn't remember the, to the cold water and keeping them alive. Then with the two brothers battling, sublimating brotherly love and violence as Americans have been so often wont to do, battling over whose version of the West is true, is saleable, is convincing, can be made into a movie, although not a film. We confront a terrible question about expressing, about articulation, about art itself. Lee has lived on the desert, has had an intimate relation with the wilderness, supposedly, but Lee has no language for telling about it. It is all fakery and wheezing and curses and yes, cliches. Austin, on the other hand, is the writer soaked in popular culture and bourgeois ordinariness. How can he render the truth out there where his father, toothless by now, drunk, alcoholic, has run to escape? Who can say it? Where is the true West? What is the connection between art and truth? When at the end the two brothers, instead of killing each other, seem to merge to become one, dark and large against the big sky, they may, as they stagger together toward the Mojave, embody the contradictory, always problematic truth about the West and about America and about the American quest. We don't know. It can't be resolved. The questions beat and thud and hang there, and the spaces of our experience become fuller and more complex and richer and more full of contradiction. We breathe harder, perhaps, and this may be the intelligibility Dewey had in mind, as well as the source of questions, the questions with which searching and learning begin. Surely an experience, surely an experience like, like, like this uh, uh, is a way of countering the anesthetic, the routine, the humdrum. Do we talk so much about? It's not only an hour and a half spent with the play, it's what is summoned up, what is incited to come alive and connect. That's what I meant by talk of possibility, of the unexpected surging up in experience. I could say, you could say, we will say kindred things about our encounter with Palabolus today, or your own workshop work with shapes you never thought a human body could take. 
with designs made by human limbs and shoulders and heads, as you will see until the very presence of the human body changes, shedding off all fixity, becoming itself a process, something changing, something becoming in space and time. I probably mentioned before a vision before a painting described by Jean-Paul Sartre while writing about how we all perceive things against the backgrounds of our own experience, about how things seem to open up from the vantage points of where we stand, from our lived situations. If the painter presents us with a field or a vase of flowers, he wrote, his paintings are windows which open on the whole world. We, fo we follow the red path which is buried among other wheat fields, under other clouds which empty into the sea, and we extend to infinity, to the other end of the world, the deep finality which supports the existence of the field and the earth, so that through the various objects which it produces, the creative act aims at a total renewal of the world. If this is true of the art of painting, of form and space and color, it's also true of music, the art of time. I think of the interplay of tonalities in Samuel Barber's piece, for example, and the openings that are the counterpoints. There is something in any case about a woodwind conversation for me that ends like many conversation with more to say with a sense of something, some sound, some frequency beyond. It may be that way too with dance, as in the many movements of peach flower landscape, with that early image of the flowing stream, with the male figure fishing, maybe playing the flute, maybe rowing, carrying us along on a kind of gentle current among the farmers in the forest into ritual, and the stream again, moving, never stopping, leave, leaving us with flow and with becoming. But then a dance is never a fixed object. It is an art bound to performance, and performance is always an occasion of experience. The, the, uh, the something happens before us, whether we're watching a Balanchine ballet or an early work or a Martha Graham, for Merce Cunningham, it goes this way. When I dance, it means this is what I am doing. It is the connection with the immediacy of the action, the single instant that gives the feeling of freedom. This is not feeling about something. This is a whipping of the mind and body into an action that is so intense that for the brief moment involved, the mind and body are one. He's talking about the kind of occasion that actualizes, that produces an immediate presence, binding choreographer, dancers, audience, and music into a continuous whole. It is a process of body engagement, a process that establishes a world through the body's moving presence. There is no sum summation in this play of powers, no end point movement, a stream, a process, moving always beyond, filling the empty space, yet not filling it, because the stream flows on and there is always more. So much of our gesturing, our thinking, even our understanding is made to seem about something. This stress on process, on movement, on the union of the mind and body seem to be of importance certainly to our personal lives as it is to the lives of those we teach. I always want to recommend a session of dancing before the young people sit down at their computers. Even as I want to enable young people to try to express through movement sometimes how they feel, what they desire, what they understand. It is another language, another way of naming another way of overcoming the emptiness. It may or may not be a mode of intelligence, I don't know, but it has to do with our marking our spaces in time, generating the spaces, the medium of perceptual experience through movement. 
and there are connections, continuities, different from, but like some of those I experience in responding to True West. There are continuities within our bodies, with other bodies, with the environment, even with the cosmos. We can reach beyond through dance or through encounters with dance, imagining, <clears throat> feeling ourselves moving beyond, moving to wider and wider spaces, taking part, someone said, in cosmic control of the world. I've been trying to talk of how reflective encounters with the arts can open spaces for us, open perspectives on the given, enhance our sense of transaction with the human and the physical world around. Dewey talked of the rhythm that marked such transaction and said that the function of art is consciously to restore the union of sense, need, impulse, and action characteristic of the live creature. I appreciate a French writer, Michel Dufresne, who says, Creation requires everything to stay in suspense as a gestation. In this sense, a work also is open, like a wound that does not heal. The rigor of perfection can become rigor mortis. To achieve it, the work risks being killed. And is it not to elude such solemn petrifaction that the work calls for participation which in accompanying it keeps the work alive. That's what we've been trying to talk about. The work of art does not conclude the matter of creation, but rather invites every individual to become a creator. I want to end this lecture by talking a little about the sense in which what we try to do through aesthetic education is to move persons to their own creativity by means of active and participant encounters with the arts. Again, much has to do with a willingness to lend the works their lives, to achieve them as, will, as meaningful by their own informed interpretation. Indeed, people can be helped to create by means of media, young and old flower, when given opportunities to inscribe images, to express their feelings in some significant language, to explore musical instruments and the sounds they make available for singing and saying. They find new energy, surely, when they discover modes of making patterns with their own bodies and movement. They find new energies as well in making a design in solving the problems of form and color, in trying to make present an imagined end. The capacity to create in these ways has much to do with an ardent, aware being in the world, as it does with opening people of many ages to the creative work of those we call artists who have refined their craft, who cannot but write or paint or compose or choreograph in order to reach others as they impose their own orders upon the world. I want to say again that participant engagements with works of art can themselves be creative experiences, especially if prepared for as you're prepared in the workshops. Creation doesn't imply a making out of nothing. It has to do with reshaping, renewing the materials at hand. Very often the materials of our own lives, our experiences, our memories. I believe many of you share with me the remarkable discovery that dimensions of your lives and life histories and pasts may be disclosed and highlighted by what you read and hear and encounter in the way of the arts. As Rilke said in one of his poems, the arts call to us, you must change your life. And the rest, we and those we teach are moved, as in few other circumstances, to pose the difficult questions and to choose. I want to end with a poem by Mark Strand called Seeing Things Whole, because it is about moving ahead to fill the empty spaces 
moving to keep things whole. In a field, I am the absence of field. This is always the case. Wherever I am, I am what is missing. When I walk, I part the air, and always the air moves in to fill the spaces where my body's been. We all have reasons for moving. I move to keep things whole. Thank you. Thank you.